Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Ask GN. Finally back from CES, working on some follow-up CPU testing for KB Lake and other CPUs, so do stay tuned for that. The questions, as always, if you have them, leave them in the comments below. I'll try to get them for the next episode. This week we have a couple that are wordy, but I think we can get through them somewhat quickly. Uh, I'm still waiting on responses from Intel on a few previous questions we sent them. They've been a bit slow getting me answers to really anything, though they do acknowledge all of the questions, so I guess that's a start. Before getting to the questions, this video is brought to you by CyberPower and their CyberXL gaming PC, which has the invertible motherboard tray layout and a couple of other cool features with the polycarbonate side panel and lights, of course. Check the link in the description below for more information on that. The first question this week is from Tam, Tom T. Chris, who says, question for Steve, many motherboards have different connections, like for your mouse, USB stick, or other device, audio ports, etc. Does the quality of signal suffer when devices are connected directly into your motherboard, into your keyboard rather? Does mouse latency increase, USB drive transfer speed decrease, audio quality worsen? Uh, is it better to connect to your motherboard instead? The one I haven't tested here is USB drive speed. That'd be kind of interesting. But generally, it, so those ports on keyboards, I know what you're talking about. They're normally called pass-throughs. So uh, the Logitech, I think the, the 710 Plus or something, a lot of them, but that one especially comes to mind, use two USB headers out of the keyboard. And one of those connects into a slot in your motherboard and basically just passes it through to the keyboard. So you should have full bandwidth. That shouldn't be a problem, uh, at least if you're doing it that way where there's two USB headers on the board, the keyboard connecting into the motherboard, then you, you do pass that signal through. The potential, I suppose, downside would be latency. Technically, if you plug into the keyboard, uh, it's got to go through one extra layer to get to the motherboard. So there could be an increase in latency there. Whether or not it's relevant, I haven't actually tested. That would be kind of interesting, but I don't have the tools to test that. In a, in a way that would be repeatable and accurate. One thing, I, just kind of in general, I do prefer to plug my mouse and my keyboard directly into the motherboard, and then if there's a pass-through on the keyboard, I'll use it for something else. Uh, I have had issues with several keyboards in the past where they'll drop signal now and then to the USB device, so I would not want that to happen to a mouse while I'm gaming, because you just lose signal for a second and have no movement. But you also don't want to happen to a USB key. so. Uh, it's not a lot of good options there. Most of them are fine, truth be told, uh, in terms of connectivity, but uh, I've had enough issues with some of the earlier samples of the USB pass-throughs on keyboards that I just generally try to avoid them for anything critical at this point other than maybe a USB key that's not gonna do a whole lot of then transfer files for a few seconds. To answer your question, I, I don't have a hard number for you. Uh, latency would increase because you are going through another layer if if not uh, digitally, definitely, at least physically, you've got more travel. But again, that could be totally insignificant. And from sort of just hands-on use, I don't know that I've really noticed any mouse speed decreases from connecting to the, the keyboard, but uh, just because I wouldn't want to drop connection and because I guess to some extent maybe uh, gaming superstition or something, I would rather have my mouse plugged directly into the motherboard. The next question is from Apple Maggot. That's a lovely name. <laughs> Apple Maggot says, question, I have a Toshiba laptop L675D that has failed and needs a reflow or reball of the video chip. What is your experience with this? Xbox 360 had the same red ring of death that was solved with reflow and third party cooling and has since turned into a cottage industry due to laptops having inferior cooling solutions. There seem to be four solutions, oven reflow, heat gun reflow, uh, professional reball with new graphics chip for $120 on a 17 inch laptop. <clears throat> so uh, Lewis Rossman, I think is his name, has a really good video on this. And it was directed at Linus from Linus Tech Tips because Linus did a reflow video some time ago. Uh, Lewis is an experienced repair technician, mostly works on Mac units but has done enough with reflowing things and actually soldering things to fix them to know what's up. R soldering, reflowing, normally you're going to reflow something because the solder has micro fractures in it. Uh, as Lewis said, it's not a permanent solution. This is something that if it works, you get a couple months out of it and then the problem comes back in a more permanent form. So this, I would not recommend using an oven to reflow your video card or your GPU. 
uh, or laptop. One, it could go wrong. And two, if it works, it's temporary. So if there's no other action, I guess you could do it to try and get data off of there, but you can still just pull the drive anyway, hopefully, and just recover the drive through an external enclosure connected to a PC or something like that. Uh, so I don't know that I would really recommend reflowing it. Maybe, maybe if you have no other good options and you need to get an extra couple months, maybe one to three months out of the thing uh, before you upgrade, maybe it's worth doing. But check out Lewis Rossman's video, and uh, it's it, he's got a pretty good one. And Linus actually revisited him in New York City where he works, and they did a follow-up video where they actually tried to reflow some stuff or uh, or properly resolder uh, some some equipment. So that's a bit educational, but generally. Uh, I would not recommend it. My experience with it is very little, and I am not an expert on it. And I don't think that anyone who isn't an expert on it should be doing it either, uh, because really your only good option is to actually properly replace the chip. And that's normally not worth it on a laptop unless it's an MXM card anyway that you can kind of just swap. If you can get a professional to do it, like you're saying, for 120 bucks, and they're actually going to properly reball the GPU rather than reflow it, then that's not a bad price. I don't know how old that laptop is, but it might be worth considering. I, I would do that before sticking it in an oven, I think. Exiled Storm asks, my question is, what is the difference between an OEM CPU, 6700K versus OEM 6700K, and why do they usually cost more money than a standard version? Uh, so the OEM CPU is normally I think on Amazon or Newegg, one of them recently I was checking, normally when it's listed as OEM, the, uh, I don't know about the k skews for Skylake because they don't come with CPU coolers, but traditionally OEM has meant that it, they remove the, the box, anything in the box other than the CPU, and they sell you a straight CPU. And the idea is that it should be cheaper, not more expensive. Kind of like how uh, any other OEM version of anything, like Windows, is going to be a bit cheaper because the idea is that it's sold to system integrators who then pass it on to a customer uh, and can do so at a reduced cost for the product. The 6700K specifically I haven't looked into, but generally it's an absence of a CPU cooler, an absence of manuals or the box and things like that. I uh, don't think it should cost more because it's not gonna give you anything special. The next question is, oh, well, and quick note, if you saw it on Amazon, their prices are all over the place anyway, so that might be why. The next question is from Rodney Rogers, who says, how easy would you say it is to revive a not working graphics card? How can you tell it's the die and not something you can repair with soldering? I would say that it is very not easy to repair a not working video card. Um, this goes into the, the, the reflowing question, just pulling out a soldering iron and applying it to parts on the GPU isn't going to fix it, especially if it's the die. There has to be something really specific that you can recognize and understand how it works and how it's connected to the PCB and what its job is uh, to, to make anything work with the soldering iron. So generally, with video cards, unless it's something really expensive, you're out of warranty, the manufacturer is not going to help you at all, retailer is not going to help you at all, if that's the case, and it's maybe a six or $700 video card, I guess it'd be worth looking into. I have no idea where to tell you to start because it's not what I do. Uh, but um, I would have to imagine that paying a professional to do that would cost close to a new card and probably it'd just be better to get a new card. So uh, the, the answer, how easy is it to revive a dysfunctional card would be not easy. The best thing to do probably is to just do some basic troubleshooting. So plug it into a different system, see if it works. If it doesn't work there, well, try different ports as well, HDMI, DisplayPort, DVI, use all of them, see what happens. Uh, you can do some testing with the different monitor just to make sure it's not the monitor that's broken. Those are all the things I would do first. After that point, if you're really desperate and there's nothing else to do, it might be worth opening the thing up and seeing if there's anything really obvious in there that's wrong. Like, for example, if the GPU heatsink is applied incorrectly or something like that, and the card is just refusing to, to function because it's running too hot too quick or something. Um, but, I, yeah, again, not really worth 
sort of reflowing or soldering anything unless you really know what you're doing and can identify the problem quickly. Uh, and I, I can't, that's not what I do. So the next question is from Super Goody. I'm planning to build my first PC soon. I'm planning to use the, uh, the i360-100. Concerned about my options. Question, KB Lake has the 1151 socket like Skylake. So could you use a KB Lake processor on a motherboard designated for Skylake? I've seen that there needs to be a BIOS update if one were to do that. How would I go about that? I plan to buy the B150i Gaming Pro AC. Would MSI release an update for this? That's on MSI. Uh, yes, you can sort of mix and match KB Lake and Skylake processors and motherboards to an extent. Check the board manufacturer's website. A lot of them have been pretty eager in releasing BIOS updates, MSI included for some of their boards. Uh, I've seen them for MSI, ASUS, Gigabyte, I think ASRock as well. A couple, I'm sure almost all of them at this point have done that. They release BIOS updates. They are for specific motherboards. So you can't just take a BIOS update from MSI's whatever gaming pro carbon or something and apply it to whatever it is you want to buy. It has to be specifically for that board. It would be listed if you type in, uh, what do you buy? MSI B150i gaming pro AC drivers. That would take you to MSI site, click the support button, download, go to BIOS, see if there's a BIOS update that has the compatibility patch that you want. Uh, and then you would download it and install it through this depends manufacturer manufacturer. You install it either through an EXE that you just run from the desktop or you put it on a flash drive, restart, boot into BIOS, go to some easy flash utility, pick the drive, pick the file and tell it to load. And then it'll flash your BIOS. Uh, it needs to be compatible. You can't lose power during this because anything like that would potentially brick the motherboard and you might not be able to get it to turn on again. So keep that in mind. It is pretty easy. So I don't, don't want to scare anyone away, but just make sure everything looks good. Um, the short answer, how do you know if a board will support it? Check their website. They will definitely tell you if it does support any kind of uh, forward compatibility with KB Lake because that's a feature to brag about. So they would let you know. Um, it's not hard to do if they do though. The next question is from, name I can't pronounce. We'll just go with semi kagate Coca. I suppose. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, question is, I, like to, I would like to know if aftermarket blower GPUs like MSI Aero and Asus Turbo are any better than reference Founders Edition in terms of cooling and sound. I'm limited in blower styles because of my case. Uh, thus, I'd like to know if it's better to go with aftermarket coolers or reference. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so it depends on the fan and the heat sink because the blower cooler itself, basically there are different types of blower fans just like there are different types of radial fans and they're going to be different qualities. The Founders Edition fan, to give NVIDIA credit where it's due, is actually pretty high end. They used a good fan. It doesn't cool very well in terms of the rest of the GPU, uh, but it's a good fan. The uh, And when I say it doesn't cool very well, I mean compared to aftermarket solutions like the dual uh, radial fans, or axial fans rather. And uh, in ter so is it good? It depends on, look up a teardown for the cards you're looking at. The MSI Arrow I don't really like to be honest, but if you look up a teardown, you'll want to look at the heatsink itself. So is the heatsink better than or equal to the Founders Edition heatsink. If it is, then, and it's cheaper, then it might be a better card to buy just because it's cheaper and it's the same cooler. Uh, heatsink, you want to pay attention to. Fin density, does it have a copper base plate or aluminum? Does it have a vapor chamber or copper heat pipes or anything like that? And they'll tell you all of those things, or they should in their marketing materials. And then you just have to find sites that have torn it apart. I haven't torn apart either of those specific cards. I am not a big fan of the MSI Aero card. I did use that, but didn't tear it down. Well, I guess we sort of did tear it down with the Seahawk, the Corsair and MSI Seahawk, mostly the same card. But uh, yes, so yeah, they can be better or worse than Founders Edition, absolutely. It just depends on if they used a better or worse fan and heatsink. And the fan for the Founders Edition is pretty good. So if they have a better heatsink on the aftermarket cards, it might be better, but uh, the fan is gonna be harder to beat. MSI is not a big fan of Asus. I have no experience with that specific card. Um, and then, oh, also, it's kind of worth noting this. The PCB layout is also important. So if you're using basically a reference PCB with a modified cooler, it normally means they've gone with a cheaper cooler, cheaper fan, cheaper heatsink, 
and they stuck with the NVIDIA reference PCB. If that happens, it's gonna be a worse card overall in terms of cooling specifically, unless they run a higher fan RPM profile, which is definitely possible. And the PCB, if it's aftermarket, they might have added to the VRM, so it might have more phases. If that's the case, you're spreading heat out over a larger area, which is important, and that could reduce your temperature as well. So it, it just depends on the specific card. Um, there's no yes, X is better than Y for this question. Uh, next question is, motherboard airflow, is it a myth? For some water cooling builds, having the radiators in some locations without case fans is clearly going to give you great temperatures on CPU and GPU, but no real airflow over the VRMs, etc. on the motherboard where you'd usually have case fans blowing air over them. Uh, and then goes on to say that they're building a water cooling system and that's the concern. Yeah, there, it's not a myth, motherboard airflow matters, but VRMs can get really hot. They can go over 100C easily in pretty much every case on a motherboard. That doesn't mean you should, you shouldn't try to do that, but I generally wouldn't worry if you're doing some serious overclocking maybe put a fan pointed directly at the VRMs, depending on how serious the serious overclocking is, because if it's actually really extreme, like Buildzoid would do, then you're going to go with something like liquid nitrogen or uh, dry ice or something like that, or Peltier cooler. But um, yeah, a lot of the VRMs, like for the, was that board reviewed, the RS Gaming 7, the Z270 board, the VRM for that, you could probably run it without a heatsink even on the motherboard because they're really not going to get that hot, especially with the new Intel stuff. They just don't tax, uh, tax the VRM that heavily. So um, I would not worry about it too much. Now, if you're putting your system in a box where there's zero airflow and your fans aren't going to push any air anywhere near the motherboard, I'd probably put a fan in there pointed at the board just to help get rid of the heat, even if it's at a low RPM, like 800 RPM, just because sitting heat makes me nervous in a computer and the memory is gonna generate heat, the PCH generates heat when you're doing IO, and of course the VRM around the CPU, the GPU VRM on the motherboard, all of that stuff generates heat at some level. So having still air is not something I like. I would put a low RPM fan in there and then hopefully that can just kind of keep it circulating enough that your liquid cooling radiators and their fans can get rid of whatever heat is sitting in the case. Uh, but yeah, not a huge deal, but definitely not something to, to just completely ignore in all use cases either. So that is it for this episode. There's a ton of CES coverage on the website, gamersnexus.net. Some of it was not pushed to YouTube because of small news announcements. Or you can check the YouTube channel, of course, subscribe for more, hit the link in the Patreon, hit the link to Patreon in the postal video to help us out directly. Uh, I guess like the video or not. I don't know what matters anymore. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.